It's not going to be about all the areas where we may differ, or where we may come in congruency. If that is an area where I can show that, okay, this is an area where Islam differs from Christianity or differs from other major world religions, okay, I'll put that in for uh, benefit's sake. But the crux of the content will be, what does Islam have to say about Jesus? Because this is one of the misinformed areas of the Islamic religion, is what do Muslims believe about Jesus? Because I've been asked on so many occasions, traveling, and I've been traveling throughout the world for about the past five to six years full time. And I've been asked on so many occasions, you know, why don't Muslims believe in Jesus? And I'm thinking, where did you get this information? Because it is a tenet of our beliefs that if you do not believe in Jesus, you cannot be a Muslim. If you say, I do not believe in Jesus, you are not a Muslim. A Muslim has to believe in Jesus as part of the tenets of faith. So this presentation will be to solidify that fact and also give some details on what is it specifically that Muslims are required to believe about Jesus and what is it that we hold in high esteem about Jesus and what does the uh, Quran say about Jesus. I can't go into the complete details because it's too much. And what maybe did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him say about Jesus. Now, when we refer to Jesus in Islam, most Muslims will refer to him with the name of Isa. And Isa is the Arabic version of Jesus. Of Jesus. And I don't know why when, when the Anglo-Saxons brought about you know, modern English, they turned a lot of Y's and, 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 and guttural letters into J's. But even my original name, Joshua, is, is Yusha or Yehoshua or Yeshua. In, in its original form, Hebrew, the same name as Jesus, uh, which was eventually transferred over to Joshua. So Islam honors all the prophets who were sent to mankind. Muslims respect all prophets in general, but we do respect Jesus in particular because we believe he is one of the five patriarchal prophets, meaning one of the five prophets that brought about newness in the way of life that God had for mankind. The newness of life, like Moses was one of those patriarchal prophets. Jesus is one of those patriarchal prophets. Uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is one of those patriarchal prophets. So we hold Jesus in a special high regard of esteem. And Jesus' mother Mary is actually held in the highest regard and esteem when it comes to women. We refer to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the greatest, one of the greatest women to ever walk the face of the earth. An entire chapter of the Quran is dedicated to her. Chapter 19 is called the chapter of Mary. We hold Jesus in high regard particular because he was one of the prophets who foretold the coming of Muhammad. Muslims too await the second coming of Jesus, which is something that is not well known uh, about the Islamic religions, is that Muslims too await the second coming of Jesus. We believe that we'll be in a different capacity with different uh, uh, um, things happening upon his second arrival, but nevertheless we do await the second coming of Jesus. We consider him to be one of the greatest of Allah's. And when we say Allah, just stop for a side moment for a minute. Because you'll hear Muslims say Allah a lot. And that word Allah gives some connotation to most people that we're speaking of a different God. That it's the Muslim God. The word Allah is only an Arabic word that means the God. It means literally the God. When we say Allah we are referring to the one true creator of the heavens and earth. Because there is a word for God in Arabic. There is a word for God in Arabic. It's ilah. Ilah means anything that you worship. Anything that is worshipped. And so we don't like to use the word God so much because it has different connotations to different people. God could be many things to many people because it's just something which you worship. But when we say Allah, when we say the God, we're referring to the one true creator of the heavens and the earth to whom we direct our worship. This is why we use the word Allah. So, a Muslim does not refer to Jesus as simply Jesus, but we follow that up by saying, Jesus, peace be upon him. And this is the honor that Islam gives to Jesus and all prophets. When we say Jesus or Isa, we will say, alayhi salam, or peace be upon him. And that is the honor that Islam is taught to give to all prophets. The position of Jesus in Islam is that no other religion in the world no other religion in the world gives, and this is again, the Muslim perspective is that no other religion in the world gives Jesus the respect and dignity as Islam does. The Quran confirms his virgin birth. 
This is without a doubt in the Islamic religion. You cannot doubt the virgin birth of Jesus Christ because it is affirmed in our book. And Mary is considered to be one of the purest women in all of creation. The Quran describes Jesus' birth as follows, and I'm going to go through it kind of quickly because you heard part of it in the beginning. But this is a different chapter. Actually, the birth of Jesus is mentioned a number of times within the Quran. Behold, the angel said, God has chosen you. And this is angel Gabriel talking to Mary. A discourse that took place between angel Gabriel, whom all of us refer to and we know Gabriel. In Arabic, he's called Jibril, the archangel, or the angel that brings the messages to the messengers. He said, Behold, God has chosen you and purified you, and chosen you above all the women of the nations. Mary, God gives you the good news of a word from Him, whose name will be Messiah. And we do affirm Jesus as the Messiah. Al-Masih, the one who is anointed, or the appointed one. God gives you the news of a word from Him, whose name shall be Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Honored in this world and the next world, and one of those who will be brought near to God. He shall speak to people from His cradle, and in maturity He shall be of one of the righteous. She said, My Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has ever touched me? How shall I have a son when no man has ever touched me? He said, Even so, God creates whatever He wills. He only needs to say, Be, and it is. So this is the story of the conversation that took place with Mary, that Angel Gabriel came and announced to her the birth of a son who would be the Messiah for his people. And she said, How can I have a son when no man has ever touched me? Gabriel told her, it is going to be that way because God creates whatever He wills. He only says be, and that creates things. We also believe that Jesus was born immaculately through the same power which, brought, which had brought Eve to life and Adam into being without a father or mother. We believe the same power that God had to create Adam, the forefather of humanity, with no father or no mother, fashion them with His two hands, breathe into them the Spirit, that same power that God was capable to bring a human being into creation with no help whatsoever, with no father, no mother, the same power could bring Jesus into life without a father. Truly, and this is in the Quran again in chapter 3, truly the likeness of Jesus with God is like the likeness of Adam. He said to him, be, and he was. The very simple teaching is Islam is that Jesus in the eyes of God is just like Adam. He created Adam and said to him, be, and he was. This is God's power of creation in Islam. God's word of be creates things and things come into being. It is within his power and it's very easy for him. To create the heavens and the earth and the universe, the great expanse and vastness of space was very easy to God. Therefore, if that was easy for him, we believe that creating Adam was very easy and to create Jesus much easier for God. Also, during His prophetic miracles, we affirm that Jesus performed miracles. We believe in the miracles of Jesus. We believe in such as in chapter 3, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I make for you, and this is one miracle that is recorded in the Quran. I make for you out of clay as it were the figure of a bird and breathe into it and it comes a bird by God's leave. And I heal the blind, the lepers, and I raise the dead by God's permission. So we believe that Jesus performed miracles. We believe one of the miracles was that He created a bird out of clay, fashioned it, breathed into it, and it became alive. Not by any miraculous divinity of Jesus, but through God's permission, because it's God that gives life. Jesus, we believe, healed the blind, God's permission. He healed the sick, the lepers. He raised people from the dead by God's permission. And all of that was easy for His Creator. When it comes to the mission of Jesus, Islam is very specific on what was the mission of Jesus Christ when He came to this earth, when He lived amongst the children of Israel 2,000 plus years ago. Muhammad and Jesus, as well as all other prophets, were, consent, were sent to confirm the belief in one true God. This is referred to in the Quran where Jesus is reported to have said, Coming, I came to attest the law that was before me. So the Quran says that Jesus came and told his people, I have come to confirm that law which was before me, meaning the law of Moses, and to make lawful to you a part of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear God and obey me. We believe that Jesus was sent to the children of Israel 
at a time and a place when they needed it. Children of Israel had gone a long way away from God at that particular time. And Jesus came as their Messiah, <clears throat> the one they had waited on for a very long time. And He came to attest that which was before Him, that He has not come to destroy the law, but He's come to fulfill it and to affirm it. And we do believe that Jesus came to rectify or ratify or modify things that were in the law. He came to make some things permissible that were made forbidden before. And the reason they were made forbidden was because of the children of Israel's uh, um, negligence before God. Because of their disobedience, God had restricted things for them. Jesus came and said, believe in me and things will be made easier for you. Modified. Things will be brought. And this is why we believe Jesus to be one of the patriarch prophets. We also believe that Jesus came with a new legislation. We believe that Jesus came with a new book called the Gospel. We refer to it in Arabic as the Injil, which means the good news. The good news. And he also said, I have been sent as a sign from your Lord, so fear God and obey me. We believe that every prophet of God was sent for one reason. One reason alone. And that was to make the Creator known. And that was to make the Creator known amongst mankind. And we believe every prophet and messenger called people to worship that one true Creator alone, with no partner. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. You should love your neighbor like you love yourself. We believe that every prophet and messenger had this simple message. Worship God, obey Him. Treat people as you would like to be treated and you will have success in this life and you will have success in the hereafter. This is the humble message of the prophets and it has not changed since it began. And we as Muslims still follow that same simple teaching. Worship God, acknowledge Him, obey God, treat people as you would like to be treated and you will have success in this life and in the next. Very simple message and we believe all the messengers carry this message. We believe the laws may have been a little bit different because they had to be. Mankind was at a different place 6,000 years ago than it was 2,000 years ago. Mankind was at a different place 600 years ago than it was 2,000 years ago. So things had to be modified. This is all part of logic. This is all part of reason. This is all part of justice. The Quran also affirms about Jesus that He was righteous. We affirm the righteousness of Jesus. And one thing that I will make as an apology, and I'm not an apologetic, I don't like to apologize for anything except where justice befits the apology. We as Muslims are taught not only to believe in these prophets and messengers, but to uphold their righteousness and defend it. To uphold their righteousness and defend it. And unfortunately, the world has only really seen Muslims defending the character of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we do that out of fervency and love for him. But one thing I believe we have fallen short on is defending the character of the other prophets and messengers as well. Because when someone insults Jesus, I take that as an offense. When I see a cartoon insulting Jesus, I'm offended. As a Muslim, I'm offended. And I feel that I wish I could do something to defend the character of Jesus. Because we affirm His character. And we take offense to any, any slightness of disparaging that character. When Moses is, is uh, uh, um, disparaged in such cartoons like Family Guy and American Dad, this guy Seth MacFarlane, he likes to abuse and, 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 and slander prophets and messengers and God Himself. We as Muslims are supposed to take offense at that. And because we haven't been so forefront, on the forefront of defending the character of Jesus, peace be upon Him, I want to apologize. We'll try to do a little bit better. Because we affirm the character of Jesus and we abhor any, any sentiments against that. The Quran says, Behold, the angel said, God gives you glad tidings of a word from Him. His name will be Christ, the son of Mary, held in this honor, in this world, in the hereafter. And He will be in the companies of those near to God. He shall speak to people in childhood and in maturity. And He shall be in the company of righteousness. And God will teach Him the book, the wisdom, the law, and the gospel. So we affirm His righteousness. We affirm His righteousness in this life. And we affirm that He will be amongst one of those amongst the righteous in the next life. Also, the Qur'an says about Jesus that He was a prophet and messenger. 
Just like all the other prophets and messengers. We believe Jesus to be one of the greatest in prophets and messengers, but that's where it ends. We believe his greatness above humanity was his connection with God and prophethood, prophethood and messengership, but in no means any way of divinity. Islam draws the line at divinity. We believe that divinity is for God alone. We believe that divinity is for God alone, and he does not share that divinity with anyone. He does not share that divinity with anything. He alone holds that power of divineness. Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger, and many messengers have passed away before him. His, his mother was a woman of truth. They had both to eat their daily food. And the reason why the Quran emphasizes the fact that they both had to eat their daily food was to distinguish the divinity of God between the divinity of Jesus. Because someone who eats and drinks is in need. Someone who eats and drinks are in need. And in Islam, we affirm that God is the one who does not have need. God is the one that is free of need. Even God says he is the one that is free of need, but you are the one who is in need. And we know we as human beings, we, we live in a fragile existence. We live in a fragile existence. We're always hanging on the brink of death. We never know when it's going to catch us. So we're always in need of things. We're always upon that fragility. If we don't drink, we die. If we don't eat, we die. If we don't breathe, we die. If our body functions begin to get out of warp, we die. If our heart stops, we die. If our liver fails, we die. So many things can go wrong with this fragility of the human uh, 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 composition that it just shows that we're really truly in need. But God is the one who we affirm is, does not have need. He doesn't need to eat, he doesn't need to drink, he doesn't need to sleep, he needs nothing. He himself is self-existing and he himself is self-sufficient, free of all need. They have their daily food. See how God makes his signs clear to them, yet see in what they are deluded away from the truth. So this is an intent for God to make clear to people that Jesus, even though he's held in such high esteem in Islam, we draw the line of divinity. We draw the line of divinity. Also, the Quran says in chapter Mary, he said, I am indeed, and this is the words of Jesus. I am indeed a servant of God. He has given me revelation and made me a prophet. He has made me blessed wherever I go. And he has enjoined on me prayer and charity as long as I live. He has made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. So peace will be on me the day I was born. Peace is on me the day that I die. And peace is on me the day that I'll be sure raised again unto life. Such is Jesus, the son of Mary. It is a statement of truth about which they vainly dispute. It is not befitting the majesty of God that he should have a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says be and it is. And this is something we affirm for God in the Islamic religion. That it is far above God to have offspring. Because he himself is the one divine. He doesn't need to have anything else. Offspring don't benefit God. Offspring are not needed from the one who is the creator of all that exists. And he shares that with no one. Also, we believe that he was a humble servant of God. And the Quran affirms that. And behold, God will say on the day of judgment, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother's is God and decoration of God? Jesus will say, glory be to you. How could I say that which I had no right to say? How could I speak of something which I had no right to say? Had I said such a thing, you would have indeed known it. For you know what is in my heart, though I do not know what is in yours. For you know full that which is hidden. Never did I say unto them anything except what you commanded me, which was worship God, my Lord, and your Lord. Worship God, my Lord, and your Lord. And I was a witness over them while I lived amongst them. When you took me up, you were the watcher over them. And you are a witness over all things. A prelude to a conversation in the Quran that will take place between Jesus and God on the day of judgment. Also, we believe that Jesus' teachings were clear as well. As the Quran affirms in chapter 43, when Jesus claimed with clear signs, he said, Now I have come unto you with wisdom in order to make clear to you some of the points on which you dispute. Therefore, fear God and obey me. God, he is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. The Creator is my Lord and your Lord, so worship Him. This is the straight way. But sex from amongst themselves fell into disagreement. So woe unto the wrongdoers for the punishment and the penalty on a grievous day. So basically the Quran affirms that the message of Jesus was worship God. Worship God. 
my Lord and your Lord. Worship God. This was the patriarch message of, message of all the prophets. Worship God. Worship the one. Because we believe in Islam that God created everything without need of it. God created everything, even the parts of creation that we'll never understand. The rest of the universe will never comprehend. But we believe that God created it without need. And He created it for the sole purpose of His worship. We believe that He created everything that He created for the sole purpose of His worship alone. And we believe that everything worships God. Everything worships God except for those who refuse to do so. And the only thing that we believe God has given that choice, that opportunity to choose or refuse, is this creation of humanity and another creation of jinn, which we don't have time for today. But we believe that the creation of humanity was the only thing given the right to choose to refuse. We believe that the sun was created to worship God, and it does so by fulfilling its role and purpose, by giving light, by giving warmth. It worships God, and it fulfills God's purpose, and it does so without dereliction. If the sun were to decide one day, you know what, today I'm going to take a day off. Just, just take a day off today. That's it. We're done for it. That's, we're, we're all done for. But the sun continues to fulfill its role in creation. Therefore, we believe that the sun is a Muslim. Because the word Muslim means someone who submits. Someone who surrenders to the will of God. And we believe everything that surrenders to the will of God and does what God wants is a Muslim. Therefore, we believe the sun is a Muslim. We believe the moon going around the earth. If the moon decided to take a day off, you know, I'm going to go spin around Jupiter today. That's it. Earth, life on earth ceases to exist. So we believe the moon is a Muslim, submitting to the way God put it there and to do what it meant to do. We believe that the air is a Muslim because the air is fulfilling a role. The air is fulfilling a purpose. It is part of God's creation and it does its job. If the air decided to take five minutes off, that's it. We're all done for. So we believe the, the air is a Muslim. We believe water is a Muslim. We believe the trees are Muslim. Because they are submitting themselves and doing what God created them to do. Therefore, we believe that as a Muslim, one willingly chooses to do that submission. And this was the message of all the prophets. Obey God. Worship God. Submit to Him. Be Muslim. Just like everything else is Muslim, be Muslim. Also, the Qur'an mentions Jesus 25 times by name and 15 times by attribute. 25 times by name, 15 times by attribute, making 40 total. 40 total references to Jesus in the Qur'an. Now, there aren't even that many references to Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Qur'an. Not by name, by attribute, yes, it would overwhelm it. But as far as name references, Jesus has higher mention in the Qur'an. Qur'an is considered to be the last and final revelation from God directly after the Gospel of Jesus. We believe that directly after the Gospel of Jesus, 600 years later, a little bit more, 610, etc., that God sent the Qur'an to mankind. And we do believe that the Gospel was practiced. As Muslims, we believe the Gospel was practiced all the way up until the coming of Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have some of the Narrations from one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, of Salman al-Farsi. He's known as Salman the Persian. Salman the Persian has a nice, beautiful story about how he was a Christian, worshipping God alone, following Jesus Christ, living with one person who would teach him the gospel. Then that person would die and they told him, go to this person. That person died, he said, go to this person. The last person he was with, he asked him, where do I go next? The man told him, I don't think there's any more of us left that really worship God the way we're supposed to worship God and follow Jesus the way we were meant to be followed. He said, but go to this land. And this land is spoken of in the Old Testament so much that I can't even get into it. The lands of Paran, where the sons of Kedr would inhabit, etc. So on and so forth. He said, go to this land. The final prophet is going to come here. So Salman al-Farsi said he went there. And he was waiting on the next prophet to come. He went to Medina. He was waiting on the next prophet. And he said one day, he, on the way there, he got captured and then became a slave. For Jew, he became a slave of a Jewish man, and his job was to pick dates. But his teacher had told him what to look for. And this story is true. It's, it's, it's narrated in so many different ways that, it, that, that, that there could not be a conspiracy to make this story up. He said that he was told that the prophet wouldn't accept charity, but he would take gifts. 
He wouldn't accept charity, but he would take gifts. And he would have a seal between his two shoulders that is the seal of prophethood. So one day, Salman al-Farsi said he was climbing the date palm tree, he was picking dates, and the prophet had just made his immigration from Mecca to Medina. And the sound came to him that there's a new prophet in Arabia, and there's a new prophet that had just come to our city. And it's funny because Salman al-Farsi said, I almost fell out of the tree. He almost put himself in, in, in the hospital. There were no hospitals, but he almost put himself in some sincere, severe circumstances. He said, I almost fell out of the tree. Climbed down and went to the prophet, took some dates to him, and the prophet asked him, is this charity? He said, yes. He said, no, thank you. He came back later, he said, here's some more dates. He said, is this charity? He said, no, it's a gift. So the prophet ate from it. He said, then I was walking around him, trying to get that glimpse of between his two shoulders. And the prophet, peace be upon him, noticed what he was trying to look at. So he just lifted his garment back and he said, this is what you're looking for? And immediately, Salman al-Farsi accepted Islam. And he became one of the most well-known companions up until this day. So we know that the truth about God and Jesus was out there. And it was being practiced. But it was far and few in between. The Quran was sent to confirm and attest that which was sent before it. The Quran did not come just to attest to the veracity of the gospel of Jesus. The Quran also came to attest the Torah of Moses. It's in the Quran, the attestment of the Torah of Moses. Also the book that was sent with Abraham, we attest to it. It's in the Quran. The Psalms that were given to David, we attest to them. They're in the Quran. So the, God, the Quran was sent to not only bring something new and to bring something that would be uh, uh, um, unique and would be something that would benefit mankind into the day of judgment, but it also came to confirm everything that came before it. Also, what did Muhammad, peace be upon him, say about Jesus? The Prophet Muhammad emphasized the importance of Jesus by saying, and this is an authentic statement, whoever believes that there is no God alone without a partner, that Muhammad is his messenger, that Jesus is the servant and messenger of God, that he is his word breathed into Mary and a spirit emanating from him, and that paradise and hellfire are true, shall be received by God into heaven. This is the beautiful message of Islam, that whoever believes in one God alone, they worship that God alone without a partner. They believe that Muhammad is indeed a messenger. They believe that Jesus was indeed a messenger sent by God, born into the Virgin Mary, a spirit breathed and emanating from God. And that paradise is true. Heaven is true. Hell is true. They will be accepted by God into heaven. Now, I will say that there are differences between Islam and the other major world religion, Christianity, that, that holds Jesus in such high esteem. But I want to also reiterate the fact that those differences are few. Those differences are few. And after years and years of, of research, I've come to realize those differences are very few. But I will accept the fact that though, even though they're few, they're great. Even though they're few, they're great. And they create a huge chasm between, between us. They create a huge chasm between us. But at the same time, we have to realize that we are all living on this earth and we all are going to be here for a very long time. Our children, our children, our children's children, until God wishes to do away with this whole creation, we'll continue to live here. And God makes a very beautiful statement in chapter 3 of the Quran. It's kind of a call that He makes out to humanity and especially, especially towards Christianity and Judaism. And the statement is, God says, say to them, and this is what I say to all of us, let us come to one word, let us come to one accordance, let us come to one agreement, that we worship one God alone. That we worship one God alone and we will not associate anything with that God. We worship one God alone and we will not associate anything with that God because He is the one that is deserving of all worship and praise. Those who do that will be upon the right path. And those who avoid that will be in plain error. Now, one thing that is highly misunderstood about Christianity and Islam is our concept of crucifixion. And I wanted to bring that up. And this was our last slide because I made this PowerPoint presentation very short and concise for a purpose to where if there was room, we could go into other subjects. When it comes to the crucifixion, this is a, one of those major chasm breaking points between Christianity and Islam. When it comes to crucifixion, 
this is what Islam holds as truth. We hold as truth that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. We believe that the crucifixion took place, as the Quran says so, that crucifixion took place, well, but we believe that, that it was not Christ who went on that cross. We believe that Christ was not the one who went on the cross, but God saved him from that, from that curse and from that affliction and from that miserable and horrible death. God saved his chosen prophet and messenger. Not only to save him from that curse and that humiliation, but because of the fact that Jesus' mess, mission was not over. It wasn't done yet. He has more things yet to do. And we believe when he comes back, he will fulfill those roles, which I'll discuss in a moment. We believe that crucifixion took place, but it was not Jesus. And Jesus was raised up into the heavens. We do not know, and this is something that I want to be clear about. We do not know who went to the cross. We can't say that for sure. Because in Islam, we're only allowed to say that which we're sure about. In Islam, we're not allowed to tell a lie. In Islam, we're not allowed to share information which we're not sure of. And that is one of the things that we're not sure of. There are some alludings to what may have happened at the time of the crucifixion. But again, they're theories. And theories are not facts. Theories are not facts. So we don't relate the theories. We relate the facts. We relate the facts that the Quran says, You did not kill Christ the son of Mary, nor did you crucify him. But we raised them up unto ourselves, and we made it seem to you that you crucified. We made him seem to you that you crucified him. And some will ask, okay, well if Jesus was raised into heaven, why did God allow the crucifixion to take place? What, what benefit does that bring? We say that, the scholars say that the reason it happened was that God wanted the children of Israel to go ahead with their plot. They had an evil intent and an evil plot, and God wanted them to go through with it so that he could be justified when writing them off from his grace. He could be justified writing them off from his grace. Because had he stopped them, they could have said, well, look, we didn't kill him. We were just joking. You know I mean? We're, you took it serious? Come on. We weren't going to really do it. It was just, <laughs> we just wanted to scare him. No, God let them, as they say, gave, him, gave them enough rope to hang themselves. We believe that Jesus will return. And we believe that Jesus will return at the time of the Antichrist, which is another similarity between Christianity and Islam. We believe in the Antichrist. We believe in the one figure, the one person. We do believe as a person. The truth about that is that it will be an individual. An Antichrist, which in Islam and Arabic is called the Dajjal, the false Christ. He will come and he will create so much mischief and bloodshed on earth. And he will be pulling people over into his false worship. We believe that he will call himself the Mahdi, which I'm not going to go to yet. Then he will call himself Jesus. And then he will say that he is God himself. And he will be calling people to worship him. And those who do so will be barred from, from any benefit in the next life. They will die as disbelievers. But we believe that there will be a war that will take place between the Antichrist and the true believers in God. We believe in Armageddon. We believe in Armageddon. We believe that it will happen. We believe that the true believers in God and the Antichrist and his followers, they will clash. They will clash. And that when the final battle is to take place, we believe that the Muslims will be marching. Muslims submitting to the will of God, worshipping God alone. That they will be marching towards where the Antichrist is, which he will be in Israel at this time. And I'm telling you this from authentic references in Islam. That the Antichrist will be in Israel at the time. In a place called Babul Lud, which is where Tel Aviv airport is right now. And that on the way there, they will be passing through the Arabian Peninsula, going through Syria. And in Damascus, the Jesus son of Mary will descend. That when they reach Damascus, at the time of the, I think the morning prayers, Jesus will descend in Damascus. And the leader of the Muslim army will step back and say, look, you are our leader. Step forward and lead us. And we believe that Jesus will say, no, you are their leader. You lead. And he will show his subservience to the one true religion of God, just like it's always been. And that we believe Jesus himself will go forward and will kill the Antichrist. Not physically. We believe that just when the Antichrist witnesses Jesus, that's it. He'll melt, just like salt. And we believe that Jesus will go on to live and fulfill the rest of his life. He will get married and have children, etc. We believe that he will die. And we even believe where he will be buried. There is a spot ready for him right now in Medina. Right next to where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is buried, there is an empty space. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, leave that there. Because Isa, the son of Mary, will be buried here. So this is what we believe as Muslims about the crucifixion. We believe that 
Jesus will come and fulfill that task, but that will be at the very, very end of days. That will be at the very end of time. And that is one of the major differences when it comes to the crucifixion. Because as I know, the crucifixion, when it comes to our fellow Christian uh, counterparts, the crucifixion is everything. Uh, everything is revolving around it. Uh, in Islam, everything revolves around the worship of one true God alone. And anything that, that, that deters from that message is not part of the message. And I want to finally say something else as a side note, and we'll get to the break and take some Q&A. Because this is something that is very misunderstood, and it's also about Jesus and Islam. Because you have to understand, we talked about Jesus, but we did not really talk about Islam. We didn't really get discussed Islam very much, because Jesus, our beliefs about Him in Islam. So I'm going to take the last five minutes to tell you what Islam is, because unfortunately, the religion of Islam is so misunderstood in its simplicity. It's overcomplicated, it's, it's, it's warped, it's misrepresented. Islam is a word. It is a word in the Arabic language and it's a noun. But the word Islam means what? Can anybody tell me? Muslims, you can speak up. What does Islam mean? Peace? Is that all Islam means? Just peace? Submission? Surrender? Worship? Willing submission? Obedience? So you see, we're getting a lot of words here. We're getting a lot of words here. You will try to hear the most referenced thing you'll hear from Muslims is Islam is peace. And that's not 100% correct. Because peace is an end result of something. What about Absolutely, peace and security. Because is not peace an end result of something? Peace is an end result. Peace is not a, a, a notion that just comes about. It is an end result of something. Islam also coming from the root word. What does it come the root word? Three letters. S-L-M. Salama. Salama means peace. Salama means submission. Salama means surrendering. Salama means obedience. All of these things are connoted in the word Islam. What Islam means simply, and it doesn't mean anything other than this. It, Islam means submission to the will of God with sincerity in obedience to Him so that I can have peace in this life and in the next life. That's Islam. Islam is to submit myself, surrender myself to the will of God in obedience to Him sincerely so that I can obtain peace in this life and in the next life. Peace is the end result of that submission. This is Islam. Anyone tells you anything other than this, it's not Islam. Because it doesn't fit to the definition. So when you hear words like Islamic extremism, this is an oxymoron. This is like oil and water. Because it doesn't fit the definition. How can you extremely submit to the will of God? In sincerity and obedience to obtain peace. There is no extreme form of that. That's outside of the definition of Islam. So it is not Islamic extremism, it's extremism. Let's call it what it is. Islamic fanaticism. Again, the Islam needs to come off because it doesn't fit in the definition. It's fanaticism, plain out and simple. Islamic terrorists. <laughs> These two things are more, like, more than oil and water. They don't fit. They don't fit into the definition. So we need to represent this truly. What does Islam mean? So that when you look at Fox News or CNN or BBC or, or Time Magazine or the Wall Street Journal and you see Islam mixed with something else, you need to ask yourself, do those, these two things fit in the same definition? Because if they don't, one of them has to go. One of them has to go. And in most cases, it's the word Islam that needs to go. Not the other word. It's the word Islam that needs to be removed from, from the scenario. Because it's not Islam. Okay. Muslim. What does a Muslim mean? These are the couple things we're going to discuss. What does Muslim mean? One who submits. One who surrenders. One who's peaceful. <laughs> Here we go again. Okay. The word Muslim is also... A word in Arabi is a noun, but it has a, 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 a different ruling. Okay, it also has somewhat of a, a unique ruling, grammatical state that we're going to talk about, so that you can understand what a Muslim means. Because when people say that Muslims did this, Muslims did that, we need to see does this fit. We need to do justice. I am better with Arabic grammar than I am with English grammar, so forgive me. I'm from the south. We don't use grammar. There's not much grammar. Not things all kind of go together. All right, in, 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 in English, if you have a verb like talk, and I want to connote 
doer of action. Like I am the one doing the action of talk. I would become the what? Talk er, and I would add the er on the end. Correct? Er on the end would denote the doer of action. Like walk, I would become the walk er, denote that I'm the one doing the walking, etc. Everybody got that? Good. In Arabic, there's a similar rule, very similar rule for denoting action, but it comes at the beginning of the word. It's actually a prefix that comes at the beginning of the word, and it's only one letter. Can anybody tell me what that letter is? Mim. It's the, it's the letter M. Put M at the beginning and it denotes, it denotes the doer of the action. For instance, that call to prayer that all of you have probably heard on the TV at some point. The, they call it what? The Adhan. It's called the Adhan. The call to prayer. The one who does that call to prayer is called the what? The Mu'adhan. The Mu'adhan. The one who calls the call to prayer. You just put the meme at the beginning and he becomes the one who calls to that prayer. The Mu'adhan. The Mu'adhan. Now, let's take this word Islam, which means what? To submit, to surrender to the will of God sincerely, to obtain peace in this life and the next. If I wanted to denote that I'm the one that's doing the Islam, I follow the same rule. I put an M at the beginning of the word Islam, connect the two together and it becomes Mu Islam or Muslim. Muslim means one who does Islam. This is simply the word Muslim. Muslim means one who does Islam. Someone who submits themselves on a daily basis and surrendering to the will of God with obedience to Him to have peace in this life and in the next. So, we understand Islam, we understand Muslims. So when you see the word Muslim extremist, it doesn't fit. It does not fit. Just like Islam doesn't fit, the word Muslim doesn't fit because Muslim means one who does Islam. Muslim terrorists, Muslim jihadists, all of these things that they connote with negatively, if there's a negative connotation behind it, they don't go together. Because the word Islam has no negative connotation. The word Muslim has no negative connotation. So if someone commits an act, whether they're Muslim or not, and that act is negative or that act has negative connotation, then this is not a Muslim act. This is an act of transgression. And this person, in some instances, is not a Muslim while doing them. There are a number of actions that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the murderer, when committing the act of murder, is not a Muslim. He has stepped out from that identity for a moment because he's committing something that is in direct contradiction to himself. So at the act of committing the murder, he's not a Muslim. He can come back to that fold, but he needs to come back to doing the action of a Muslim. The one who commits adultery in the act of adultery, they're not a Muslim because they're stepping outside of their own definition. They're becoming someone whom they're not. So we need to understand this. And we need to put things in their proper perspective that when we see horrible acts attributed to Muslims. They're not the acts of a Muslim. They're not the acts of a Muslim whether or not those people claim to be Muslim or not. Because they themselves are committing act that is derogatory and contradictory to the definition. So we need to call it what it is. It's a crime that is committed by an individual or a group of individuals. And it needs to be dealt with in, 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 in that scenario. And that even-handedness needs to be done. It needs to be done. Because if we were to judge all of the major world religions based on its adherence, there would not be a single good religion left. If we were to base all major world religions upon the acts of its adherence, throughout history every religion would have been written off as terroristic. Every religion would have been written off as being guilty of terrorism at some point. Every religion would have been written off as guilty of fanaticism at some point, as guilty of extremism at some point. So justice needs to be done. It needs to be done. This guy who killed 60-something people in, um, Norway. In, in Norway, he wrote an entire tirade on, on, on the internet, you know, uh, about it. And, and he was, said he was religiously motivated. Can we contribute that to being the compendium of his religion? No. Because he himself wasn't adhering to the adherence of the religion. So he committed a criminal act, stepped outside of the bounds of the religion. And this has, needs to be given, and it was given that. They didn't blame his religion for it. They didn't call him a religious fanatic. They called him an idiot. They called him a criminal. They called him a fool. They called it what it was. So this justice needs to be done. We ask for this even-handedness on both sides. We would expect to do it with you, and we would expect it to be done with us. We would expect it to be done with us. Because in Islam, the sources for Islam, and this is what we're going to finish with, and maybe I'll, they want me to go to 345, so I'm going to get to wrangle you a little bit. 
In Islam, because the brother who spoke before me talk about judge, judging Islam properly. Get, make sure the sources that you get about Islam are proper. Because you can find, if you go to uh, what I like to tell the Muslims, we call him Sheikh Google. Sheikh Google. You guys all know who Sheikh Google is. He's got a lot of knowledge. But if you go and you type Islam in Google, you're going to get a lot of stuff. And not all of it, the majority of it's, it's way out there. But there are only two sources you can get information about Islam. Two sources only. There are only two sources you can get information about Islam. And I will tell you, if you want to know about Islam, if it doesn't come from these two sources, accept it as dubious. I don't care who it comes from. I don't care, even if it might be the truth, except it is dubious if they don't reference these two sources. You have to be careful. Be careful. There are only two sources that you can derive Islamic information from. What is the first source, brothers and sisters? The Quran. And that Quran has been preserved for 1400 years. It hasn't been changed, it hasn't been tampered with, it hasn't been altered, adulterated, nothing. It's there. The Quran. And not the Quran translated by so and so. That's not the source. The Quran translated by Yusuf Piktal, Muhammad Asad, Sahih Internet, that's not the source. The Quran is written in the Arabic language and preserved in that language and it needs to be understood in that language and there are only a hierarchy or echelon of people that can do that. It takes, it takes some skill to do that. This is why we refer to the people of knowledge. The Quran is the only place, number one, that the sources for Islam can be derived from. What is the second source? Sunnah. What we refer to as the Sunnah, which means the actions the sayings, the approvals, or the uh, um, action sayings or approvals of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is it. What the Prophet Muhammad said, what he did, what he approved of. This is the sources of Islam. Anything other than this is not Islam. Islam goes so far to protect these two sources. I want you to see this. Islam goes so far to protect these two sources that if someone were to use their logic, let's say I wanna, I wanna try to use my logic to figure out a problem, and I use my logic alone, and I figure out a problem, and that problem is correct according to the Quran and according to the Sunnah, but I use my logic alone to get there. Am I correct, brothers and sisters? No, I'm incorrect. I would be incorrect because I gave logic priority over these two sources. Even though they came to the same place, Islam says that is incorrect. Because if you open that door, then that door can lead you many other places. The logic, in, even the logic, even the, the reasoning capacity of the human being in Islam is confounded inside of the boundaries of the Quran and the Sunnah. Can't go outside of it. So if you see something that says, Islam teaches such and such. Islam says such and such. Islam promotes this. Islam promotes that. Find out, did they get this from the Quran, not translated by so-and-so, not interpreted by so-and-so, but did they get this directly from the Quran and directly from the statements of the Prophet Muhammad put into their full context? If they did not, then it's not Islam. Point blank and simple. It's someone else. It's some, some so-and-so's uh, version of Islam. And there's only one version. That which is in accordance to the Quran, and the Sunnah. That is it. That is it. And since I have a few more moments, I want to bring up a couple of words that have become taboo in American society. And I, I am on a campaign to remove this stigma off of these two words because there's nothing negative about them. And I won't apologize for them whatsoever. And I, hopefully you'll see today why. What are the two most feared words brought up about Islam? Jihad, and what is the S word? Sharia. You guys have heard these words, right? 